from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Tomoko Steen at Science, Technology, and the Business Division here at the Library of Congress. Today's event is uh, sponsored by our division, Science and Technology and Business Division. Can you hear me out there? Okay, yeah, I guess. Uh, today's speaker, Dr. Dan Lucy, is an infectious disease physician and also professor at Georgetown Medical School. He has done a medical degree in 1981 at Dartmouth and also MPH at Harvard, uh, focusing on tropical disease. And he has done also a residency at uh, UCSF, University of, University of California, San Francisco, and also Harvard. He has been working on uh, so-called deadly disease for many years. And his first encounter was HIV. 1980. So back then, people didn't know what HIV was, and he treated the patient uh, infected by HIV. And uh, since he has been dealing with so many different uh, type of uh, uh, infectious disease in throughout the world, so SARS outbreak in Hong Kong and Toronto and uh, also the MERS, most recently Middle Eastern version of the SARS, and uh, in Middle Eastern countries, as well as uh, North Africa. And uh, also we had an incident of the anthrax. Dr. Lucy was here, and uh, he was uh, trying to find a way to treat the patients, save the patients. And uh, he's also, also author of the uh, monograph published from National Academy of Sciences. Um, you can see the detail of the biography in the outside I have a handout, so please pick it up if you haven't. So um, last few years, uh, Dr. Lucy has been working on the uh, Ebola. And uh, uh, last year, for example, he was in uh, Sierra Leone treating patients and uh, this year, I was amazed to uh, see him in a spring break airplane, <laughs> um, going to Liberia, working for doctors without the borders. You know, it's a, using even spring break to uh, contribute and helping patients um, suffering from the, this disease. And um, by talking to him, so he. He says the most recent concern is uh, orphans, children left behind in these countries because parents died by uh, Ebola. And um, he's trying to help and uh, you know, fundraise also for those children. Uh, you can see some of the pictures over there uh, he kindly brought and shared with you all. So before further ado, um, Please join me in welcome, Dr. Lucy. Thank you very much, Dr. Tomoko Steen, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, for that very kind uh, uh, introduction. So I do have a, a few slides, uh, a lot of pictures, and I can go through those pretty quickly. They'll be self-explanatory. Uh, please don't hesitate uh, uh, to ask any questions or make any comments, as Dr. Steen uh, mentioned. Um, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be here today, and I thank all of you for making the time to come here uh, for this presentation to take time out of your very busy schedules. Uh, so again, please, I favor interactive uh, presentations, so don't hesitate to ask questions or to make comments. Uh, I'd like to um, begin by uh, uh, honoring a, a colleague, a, a physician, 
uh, from Sierra Leone who died of Ebola uh, after being infected in, in Sierra Leone, Dr. Martin Salia. Uh, he's one of over 860 healthcare workers in West Africa who have become infected with the Ebola virus during this outbreak, um, and one of uh, uh, almost exactly 500 who have died. Uh, fortunately, no U.S. citizens, uh, uh, healthcare workers or otherwise, have died of Ebola, uh, to my knowledge, as of today. Uh, some memorial service for Dr. Martin Salia at uh, Georgetown uh, in early December. He had a special connection with the Georgetown community because they uh, did work together in another West African country in Cameroon. Uh, and I was asked to give the uh, introduction um, um, at the memorial service uh, for Dr. Salia um, um, because we both worked, although at different times uh, this past year, at Connaught Hospital uh, in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, I won't go through this. Uh, Dr. Steen uh, mentioned uh, that uh, there's a pamphlet that just summarizes my life for the last 33 years, so um, that's it. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be able uh, to have been able and hopefully uh, soon to be able to go back uh, for the fourth time to West Africa related to the response to the Ebola epidemic. Um, on March 23rd, uh, um, it was said to be the one-year anniversary, uh, at least of the declaration or the recognition or the announcement of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Um, uh, scientists think that uh, probably the epidemic started uh, earlier in December of 2013 in Guinea, um, but it wasn't until around March 21st or 22nd that the first laboratory confirmation of the virus as the cause of the outbreak uh, was made uh, in a laboratory in France, in Lyon. Um, a sample from a patient was flown by Air France to Paris and, and then eventually um, proven uh, uh, to be the Ebola virus as the cause of the epidemic. Uh, and that was announced uh, a day later, uh, March 23rd of 2014. So one year later, this March 23rd of this year, um, CNN had a special uh, uh, event, if you will, uh, and uh, they asked me to, to speak for a couple of minutes, answer questions about the outbreak. And so now there are over 25,000 uh, persons in Sierra Leone, uh, plus Liberia, plus uh, Guinea. Um, and a very small number, uh, but always significant, um, in Nigeria and uh, Senegal, though those um, chains of transmission have, have stopped in those countries. Uh, and over 10,000 people have died due to the Ebola virus in this epidemic. So the first report, again, was a little bit over a year ago, a year and, and two weeks ago, on the WHO website. <clears throat> and this map from the WHO website at the time shows the area in red where the initial outbreak was recognized. Again, it's in Guinea, but you can see that um, uh, there are two white arrows, arrows uh, moving down to your left from the red uh, area, and those go into Liberia, into Lofa County, in the bottom white arrow, um, and then uh, into Sierra Leone, uh, into eastern region uh, around uh, Kailun in, uh, in the other um, uh, white arrow. So in other words, the outbreak started in a border region. Thank you. In a border region of the three countries, um, first in uh, Guinea and then, Sierra, then, then recognized in Liberia within a week later, by the end of March, uh, and probably there were cases of uh, patients with Ebola in, in Sierra Leone um, also very, very soon after, but it wasn't recognized for about two more months. Okay. So here's from Guinea into Liberia and in Guinea into Sierra Leone. This is Sierra Leone surrounded by Guinea, a very large country compared to Sierra Leone, um, and this is Liberia down here. The capitals of the three countries are all on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so Conakry, the capital of uh, Guinea, Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone, and Monrovia, the capital of Liberia. And I mention that because um, the next slide, you can see that um, Ebola had never been in a capital city before. There had been 23 outbreaks of Ebola documented, probably many more, since 1976 when it was first discovered um, in both uh, the former Democratic, the former Zaire Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, and in Sudan. But it had never been in the capital cities um, before. But from the very beginning, it was reported end of March and certainly confirmed by 3rd of April that it was in Conakry, the capital of Guinea. Um, and later the epicenter by uh, August would be Monrovia, the capital of Iberia. And then by November, December of 2004, the epicenter of the epidemic in the region would be in uh, Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. And I, I think that that's very important that the outbreak was in capital cities because the way that we control all the previous ab outbreaks of Ebola, 23 or so outbreaks, um, was um, by isolating people who are sick, 
mostly in rural areas, usually just one rural area. Uh, quarantining people that um, are not sick but have been exposed, that come into contact with someone who was sick, and identifying those patients or people through contact tracing, putting them in quarantine, watching them closely in case they do get sick, to help them and also to prevent them from having contact with other people and spreading the virus. Because fortunately, Ebola, if there's anything, there's very few fortunate things about Ebola virus. One is that it's not spread through the air. It's not spread through the air. And the second thing I want to emphasize that's fortunate, if I can use that term at all, about Ebola virus is that a person with Ebola virus infection is not contagious until they become sick. Not contagious until they become sick themselves. Um, so, uh, after I saw this report about the virus being in the capital city uh, last April, uh, April 8th, uh, actually it was maybe a few days sooner, I started writing uh, some uh, basic frequently asked questions uh, as a way to uh, help get basic information out to colleagues uh, in the medical and public health community here uh, in the region. And then with colleagues in Minnesota and Virginia and New York City and elsewhere, we wrote up and then um, disseminated these frequently asked questions through various hospital systems. Um, Again, emphasizing that there was urban Ebola as well as rural Ebola in the forested regions um, where the three countries um, had borders, shared borders. Uh, it wasn't, um, well, let me just say, um, my uh, two colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Dan Hamfling and Dr. Uh, John Hick and Virginia and Minnesota respectively are emergency medicine physicians and they contacted their colleagues in the Health and Human Services headquarters here in D.C and had these frequently asked questions um, that we had written up together uh, sent out through uh, the hospital preparedness program of health and human services, meaning that it went out to uh, many hospitals across the entire country and got posted on the internet. I don't know about YouTube, but at least uh, otherwise uh, in print. Um, and it wasn't until August 8th that the World Health Organization um, uh, declared this Ebola outbreak in West Africa a public health emergency of international concern, abbreviated PHEIC. And that has very specific um, uh, uh, meaning and significance and helped to galvanize the international uh, response uh, to come together to uh, try our best um, as, a, as an international community, uh, working with um, our colleagues in, in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and, La and uh, in Guinea to control and eventually, hopefully, be able to completely stop uh, the virus outbreak, the epidemic. Um, but now it's been more than a year and perhaps 16 months in Guinea since December 2013, um, and it's not over yet. I think that's a very important point I want to emphasize, and I'll do it on the final slide also, that the Ebola epidemic's not over yet. And until it's over in all <laughs> countries in the region, um, there's always a risk that it will come back into any country that has reached zero patients and maintained zero patients for at least 42 days, the, twice the upper limit of the incubation period of 21 days. Uh, with colleagues at the Georgetown Law School, Dr. Gostin, Lawrence Gostin, and Alexandra uh, Phelan um, from Australia, we uh, wrote an article quickly over that weekend, um, and uh, through Dr. Gostin's um, uh, professional uh, reputation, we were able to get it published very quickly in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, by August 11th. But um, by August 10th, I was very, very happy because finally I was able to get on the plane. It was wheels up and I was on, on the way over to Sierra Leone. Um, so in the past, uh, I've been fortunate to be able to go to outbreaks like SARS in Hong Kong, just get on a plane and go. Um, and, and similarly for Middle East respiratory syndrome in multiple countries in the Middle East. Um, but uh, Ebola, I thought, was a little bit different um, because of the personal protective equipment that is required in the process for safely taking off the personal protective equipment when there's virus all over the equipment uh, so that you don't get infected. And, and uh, so I hesitated, just got on a plane and go. Um, but finally, I was able to go with a, a non-government organization, NGO, um, in, uh, on, on August uh, the 10th to Freetown, Sierra Leone. And I was able to work with the Ministry of Health to do personal protective equipment, or PPE, abbreviated PPE. And I like to say Ebola PPE, really, because I think Ebola PPE is different than most other personal protective equipment for influenza, for SARS, for MERS, uh, for plague, for cholera, et cetera. Um, 
and worked at Connaught Hospital, uh, which is the largest hospital uh, in, the, in the capital um, and in the western area uh, of Sierra Leone. Uh, on your right, you see the, um, uh, the chief nurse for the entire uh, Ministry of Health of Sierra Leone, um, and on the left, a doctor from the UK. Um, and uh, they asked us to, uh, the doctor from the UK and then myself, to um, help do the training for, on the personal protective equipment for many nurses and some doctors. There really aren't many doctors in Sierra Leone or Liberia or Guinea. Um, and so that's what we did. But obviously, the doctor from the UK and myself, we come and go. But the, our national colleagues in each of the countries, of course, it's their country. They, they were there before we got there, and they're there after we leave. Um, unless, of course, God forbid, they're one of the 860 who get infected or 500 who have died due to Ebola. Um, so uh, working with a, uh, a colleague, a Sierra Leonean a physician right here, um, we uh, 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 took turns, sort of trained the trainer, and the doctor from UK trained me, and then I helped train some of the other uh, Sierra Leonean colleagues. And uh, this doctor trained many other nurses and doctors. And altogether, it was well over 120 people. We trained just over nine days, because that's how much funding we had, the Ministry of Health, I should say, had at the time. Uh, but then people who trained went out back to the eastern region, where the outbreak was the worst, and then subsequently to other areas in the western region, which became the epicenter of the disease by November and December. Uh, it's the hospital where we worked. Um, it was, um, I would say, um, importantly suboptimal conditions for the patients um, and also for the um, health care providers in the Ebola unit, um, which was primarily run by um, um, some um, nurses from Sierra Leone, uh, Canad Hospital, um, and also one doctor from Spain, Dr. Marta Lado, L-A-D-O, and Dr. Oliver uh, Johnson from from the UK, from King's College London. Um, before I left, uh, the end of August, there was a big meeting, uh, maybe 30 people in a room, much like 30 plus people in this room, almost 40 people, and, and uh, it was organized by the uh, uh, Irish ambassador to Sierra Leone and, and Liberia, and um, um, Dr. Uh, Marta Lada and I went. We were invited to come and talk about some of the problems, so I don't list them all here. I made a list, one page. 18 problems and 18 solutions because no one really wants to hear about problems without proposed solutions. And also let people like to see just on one page. And so on the left were the <coughs> problems and on the right were the solutions. And I just want to emphasize on the top, the personal protective equipment, it was really importantly suboptimal. We didn't have goggles that you could see out of. We had no hoods to protect all of our skin, so I exposed skin. The gloves didn't come up above the wrists, which is not good, so we'd take our sleeves and poke a hole in the sleeve and then put your thumb through the hole to keep your, your sleeve down over your, what otherwise would be your exposed wrist. So not, not, not optimal situation. Um, there were other things that weren't optimal, but I don't want to really dwell on those um, at this time. Uh, in the middle of August, we didn't have a diagnostic uh, laboratory. All the blood samples from the patients had to be sent about five hours away by car. Sometimes the car didn't have petrol, so um, couldn't be sent. The labs usually took about three days to come back. Um, we had to, of course, transport children and sometimes babies, but <coughs> the, the transport vehicle didn't have a car seat or babies, you know, anything to, you know, to safely transport the child, so we had to improvise, improv improvise. And so over and over this became a theme, both in Sierra Leone and Liberia, is you have a big problem that seems insurmountable and there's no good solution. So you have to do the next best thing, which is look at what solutions there are, none of which are good, and choose the one that's least bad. So for the, for the baby who didn't have any parents or anyone to, to hold him or her uh, on the five-hour trip to the hospital or far away, um, um, we bought what we called the baby Moses basket. So we went out to the market, asked someone to go to the market, buy the basket, um, and, uh, and fill it with some newspaper and other softer material, put the baby in the basket, and, um, and then tried to secure it in the back of the vehicle. Um, one thing that everyone said, everyone, healthcare workers, non-healthcare workers, um, in August in Sierra Leone was that as bad as it was, it was much worse than August, as I'll show in a minute, in Monrovia, Liberia, in the capital of Liberia, which was then the epicenter of the epidemic. And we said, we cannot let Freetown become Monrovia. 
and many organizations were there, the Ministry of Health, obviously, the World Health Organization, United Nations, that Dr. David Nabarro came to visit, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the U.K. Uh, folks that I've mentioned, the Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, and other non-governmental organizations. And again, I highlight the Irish Ambassador, Ambassador Walsh, who did a fantastic uh, job to bring people together um, so that we try to prevent Freetown from becoming Monrovia. But that's just what happened. November, December, Freetown became the epicenter of the, uh, of the outbreak. Uh, some pictures on, on the center, and the red is the Minister of Health. On the right, the head of the um, uh, Doctors Without Borders in Sierra Leone at the time. On the left, uh, the World Health Organization uh, representative. Um, unfortunately, tragically really, uh, m many or most, uh, most of the hospitals in Sierra Leone and the clinics closed because the healthcare workers were getting sick and infected, patients were dying of Ebola. You didn't know if someone had Ebola or had malaria or typhoid or some other illness. Um, because the symptoms of Ebola, um, or what I like to call Ebola-like illness, or ELI, e Ebola-like illness, sometimes we talk about influenza-like illness or ILI, well, this is Ebola-like illness, ELI. It's simply three things, fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. It's not heavy bleeding. It's not hemorrhage, which you see in the movies and old textbooks and all that. It's fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. But that's also the same sort of symptoms, Ebola-like symptoms uh, that you can see with many other diseases, like, like malaria, like typhoid, like other infectious and non-infectious diseases. And so great fear occurred about Ebola. And um, as a result, many hospitals closed. This was the one big pediatric hospital, a hospital for children. And, in Freetown, in fact, for the whole country. And it closed in the middle of August when I was there because they had one child who was sent to our, our testing unit to, 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 um, to be evaluated who ended up having Ebola. There was no personal protective equipment for the nurses, for the doctors, and uh, there was great fear. So in 24 hours after the child was diagnosed, the entire hospital was emptied. It was closed. So all those very, very sick children with all the other diseases that occur before Ebola that still occur now, that have occurred during Ebola, and will unfortunately continue to occur for some time to come. Um, all those very sick patients had to be discharged and presumably sent home or sent somewhere. And so really there's been an epidemic, not of Ebola, but an epidemic of deaths due to non-Ebola diseases. People can't get their medicines for diabetes, for tuberculosis, for HIV. So I think this is a very important point that's been underappreciated. The epidemic of deaths due to non-Ebola disease during the time of Ebola in West Africa, 2014-15. So I came back in September, there's no quarantine, and the media was very happy to uh, have anybody that was willing to be interviewed, so I was very happy to be interviewed, unlike the previous 10,000 years of my life, or a lot, a lot of my, I was always scared of the press, oh, we're being recorded, I shouldn't say that. Okay, so now, I, uh, let me put it positively, I, I was very happy to speak with the media because I really felt I had something strong that I wanted to express about the terrible situation and how we need to do whatever we could to make it better, or at least less bad, in West Africa, and start to prepare better in the United States. Um, so one of the questions I was asked in September in CNN was why West Africa matters. Um, so I thought that was nice that she asked me such an obvious question, and you can find the obvious answer on, on the Internet. Um, and uh, also at this time, the president, uh, and I think with support from Congress, fortunately uh, um, decided to have a very big response uh, in September uh, to the epidemic in West Africa and uh, decided to quickly send over uh, approximately 3,000 uh, troops uh, to build Ebola treatment units and to work with colleagues uh, in the countries, especially in Liberia. And again, the, uh, the media, the print media, uh, this is from September 20th, uh, started writing a lot of articles, including this one about Sierra Leone. There was a lockdown. This was in September, and I mentioned that because there was one also just uh, uh, 10 days ago, March 27th to the uh, 29th, um, again, because of the um, situation where Sierra Leone became the epidemic. Uh, so then I was fortunate to be able to go soon after, the end of September, to train in Brussels, Belgium, with Doctors Without Borders, and then to fly into their big hospital uh, uh, in, 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 uh, to fly into Monrovia, where they had a, a very large hospital, the largest ever built for uh, an Ebola outbreak uh, in Monrovia, uh, uh, Liberia, with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF. Uh, also, again, worked with Ministry of Health a bit there. I always try to go, and uh, when I go overseas, to work with colleagues, 
doctors, nurses, public health officials in, in hospitals, but also in the Ministry of Health. And whenever possible, to be able to work with patients who have these new emerging infectious diseases. Uh, this is a picture from the uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders MSF uh, one year um, critique, if you will, you can find online March 23rd of, of this year. And this is a picture of the hospital where, um, where I ended up working in October, but this is in August when the situation was totally overwhelming. And I'll show you just a couple of pictures about how overwhelming it was, and then mostly I'll show pictures of how it got better. And really the, the joy, if you will, if that doesn't sound like an inappropriate word, um, with regard to helping patients, uh, along with my uh, many nurses uh, and, and our teams of MSF uh, volunteers, um, later on in October and November to help patients survive uh, and having patients help each other to survive Ebola. That was the, the joy that, that I certainly didn't anticipate. But August, there really I don't think was any joy because um, there wasn't enough room for all the patients. So this is the outside of the gate. These are the patients that lined up every, every morning and throughout the day and the night, some bringing their children um, who had Ebola. And uh, the gates were only open for 30 minutes every morning out of every 24 hours because the number, and, and, and this is stated, this is not my opinion, um, it's stated in the MSF um, critique from March 23rd, the, 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 um, they could only allow in every morning over 30 minutes the same number of new patients with Ebola as the number of patients with Ebola who had died the night before. And you had to turn everyone else away, knowing that their chance of surviving was very, very, very low, less than if they were able to be cared for in the hospital, and also that because they were sick, then they were contagious. Remember I said in the beginning that, to emphasize that if you have Ebola, you're not contagious until you're sick. Well, everyone here is sick. They have symptoms, they have illness. It was a horrible situation, and uh, I, one that I hope never happens again, and I hope personally I'm never in that situation. I'm not sure that I could have tolerated or recovered from it. So again, this is a picture from the uh, Doctors Without Borders March 23rd of this year um, update. Shows them building this uh, really large tent uh, at this hospital where I worked um, a little bit later, which is called ELWA3, ELWA3, ELWA. Uh, it was a part of the Monrovia that had been named ELWA for many years. And anyone know what it stood for? When I heard what it stands for, when I first heard it, I, I didn't quite believe it, to be honest, but, but it's the truth. It stands for Eternal Love Winning Africa. Eternal Love Winning Africa. And this quote I'll, I'll just go through quickly because um, um, I think it's very important and, uh, uh, um, to, to, to understand how bad the situation was. I think it's fair to say that we are doctors without borders. This is said by, a, uh, by someone who worked in August in Monrovia from Doctors Without Borders. But we are not without limits, and we've reached our limit. It's very frustrating because I see the huge needs, but I simply don't have the human resources. We have the money thanks to our donors. We have the will. We certainly have the motivation, but I don't have enough people to deal with this. So what I found was even one person, certainly two, three, five, ten, 12, 15, could make a huge difference. Even one person could make a huge difference in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the care of the individual patient, helping them to survive, and helping break the chain of transmission of the epidemic in the communities. And this is the last quote I want to make again from uh, August uh, MSF field coordinator in Monrovia, uh, Brett Ab Adamson. He said, I'm horrified by the scale of the center, meaning the hospital that you just saw that they were building that I worked in, in October, November. I'm horrified by the scale of the center we're constructing and the horrible conditions inside, what people are enduring. That means patients, mostly. It's horrible what our staff are having to do with the risk and the heat. We're struggling to deal with the number of patients. It was overwhelming. We had to turn people away from the, at the gate. We're trying to adapt and build as the need increases, but we're not keeping up. We feel tremendous guilt and shame that we can't adequately address the needs of the people. So I arrived October 3rd with a team of other volunteers from around the world. One of the great, greatest things I found about MSF is you have colleagues working with you and you're instantly your, your friends, colleagues, you're bonded from Iran, Pakistan, Brazil, Hong Kong, all throughout Europe, um, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Uganda, South Africa. Yeah. Uh, this was the entrance. 
uh, where we had to go in and get our temperature checked every time we went in. Uh, and when we came out, we had to have our, our boots sprayed, uh, had to wash our hands in the appropriate concentration of bleach. Um, there's nothing came out of the so-called hot zone where the patients are. Nothing came out. Everything had to be burned. And here's uh, one of the happiest pictures. Now I'm going to show pictures fairly quickly, and I realize time is short. We don't leave time for questions. Um, um, but these are a small number of the more than 600 uh, very brave Liberian colleagues, uh, mostly nurses, some nurses' aides, a few physician assistants. Um, but there were no Liberian doctors uh, at this uh, facility. There were doctors from South Africa. Uh, there were colleagues from Uganda, a physician assistant, uh, Stanley. Uh, we worked together. There were four shifts, um, three shifts that worked around the, you know, basically eight-hour shifts. And then you had a, a rest, and then you come right back the next day. And this went on for until it was over. Um, the hospital was just closed about a week ago. Um, and it opened in, in mid-August. Um, uh, so very briefly, um, I just want to say that as a physician, I feel that <laughs> Ebola is a doctor's disease. Not everyone agrees with that. I think it absolutely is. Some people say it's not because there's no specific treatment for it, that it's a nurse's disease. Um, I strongly disagree with that. Um, and uh, I think that it, it requires all health care workers, nurses, nurses' aides, physician assistants, and doctors to work together to improve the survival of our patients. And so after one week there, I found it a very difficult situation, uh, hard to tolerate, really. Um, but I realized I couldn't leave, but I had to make it better somehow by sitting and talking with the nurses and physician assistants. And so we came up with this uh, plan, uh, four steps to help our patients survive Ebola. And uh, uh, a colleague from MSF, uh, one of the people who's on the cover of Time magazine, uh, Alice Stryker Watson, she hired a Liberian artist, she's an anthropologist herself, hired an artist, he made these drawings, and um, we didn't have the ability to put any intravenous uh, fluids into the patients. So we only could give oral fluids, but again, as I mentioned, patients have a lot of vomiting, so they can't take oral fluids. So okay, it seems an insurmountable problem, but you, you, can't, you can't let an insurmountable problem stop you from helping your patients. So. We gave lots of medicines to uh, decrease and eventually stop the vomiting and um, to decrease the diarrhea because that's how I patients die of Ebola. It's not from bleeding, with few exceptions. It's mostly from vomiting and diarrhea, losing so much fluid and substances in the blood like potassium that, that that's why you die. So in a sense, that's good news. Again, I hate to say anything is good news with Ebola, but, it, but in a sense it is because you have medicines to stop the vomiting and diarrhea, or at least slow them down enough to then give lots and lots of oral fluids with potassium, with sugar, with sodium. And so that's what we did. Uh, it's called oral rehydration solution, same medicine that saves people with, uh, who have cholera and profuse diarrhea with cholera. Uh, and the one other key uh, step that we uh, came up with finally was that as more patients survived, they became what I call pre-survivors. So they weren't allowed to leave, but they were strong. They could eat, drink, walk, play the radio, ask me for better food. And I said, ah, that's good. That means you're, gonna, you're probably going to survive. <laughs> but it also means that you can't leave yet until the blood's gone from, I'm sorry, the virus is gone from your blood. And therefore, while you're still here 24 hours a day, not needing to wear any heavy personal protective equipment, we ask the pre-survivors or the stronger patients to help the weaker patients, those who are still so weak they're on their back or stomach with diarrhea and vomiting, they can't even sit up to drink the life-saving treatment, which is oral rehydration solution. And that really made the biggest difference, in my opinion, asking the stronger patients to help the weaker patients. And they themselves, seven or 10 days earlier, were the weaker patients. So they know exactly what it's like. Also made a rule that tents were very hot. We had mostly small tents, not that great big one that I showed. And so he said everybody by you know, early morning when it started getting really hot had to come out of the tents. And this is one of the uh, children that was very, very weak. His sister had died. He was very, very weak. He couldn't even sit up. And so we just picked him up and took him out of the tent one day. And, uh, and after that, it occurred to me that everybody should be out of the tent, children and adults. And, and so we made that a rule. And we created some shaded areas in between the tents and just laid the, um, there weren't really mattresses and there were no beds. It was, it was just really like gym mats, what we call gym mats in, in the States. Just laid them in between the tents where there's shade. Have the patients lay there if they're not able to sit up. If they can, and they'd sit in these chairs, these white chairs. And, um, and we would help them in the short time that we could go in in our full protective equipment, which is only supposedly about 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the afternoon. Um, but again, the stronger patients 
they're in there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So it's really through their efforts to help the weaker patients like this young boy to drink oral rehydration solution and then eventually start to eat food that more and more patients survived. Some of the pre-survivors, you can say they're you know, quite jovial. So I'm, I'm standing where, where you are in the front row. There's an orange fence that separates uh, us, uh, well, the, uh, the healthcare providers in the tent where we don't need to wear any personal protective equipment and we can talk um, to, to the, to the pre-survivors because the virus is not airborne. So we don't need any personal protective equipment to talk through the tent just a few feet away. So uh, <clears throat> I just very briefly mentioned we came up with eight um, simple innovations, and most of which I've mentioned uh, to help patients survive. The first was to give the medicines directly observed to make sure the patient is taking the, um, the anti-vomiting medicine, for example, or the, the, the medicine to bring down the, the fever. Uh, we had to give oral rehydration solution, but that's a life-saving treatment. People say there's no treatment for Ebola, but there is, and this is it. If you can give intravenous medicine or fluid, then, then do that, but that wasn't an option that we had at the time in October and early November. Um, very fortunately, by working together, especially having the stronger patients help the weaker patients, we had more than 70 survivors in, in, in five weeks. Um, um, it's very important to have direct I think set an example, the nurses, a, doc, a few doctors. So there were three doctors, three of us, from Germany, South Africa, and myself for 136 patients when I arrived on October 3rd. Um, but again, many, many uh, Liberian nurses. Yes, ma'am. Question. Wasn't there a risk of reinfection with the stronger patients? Hmm. They weren't quite out of the woods yet. Right. So actually, they were still infected. They were still. Uh, the question was, wasn't there a risk of the stronger pass, uh, to the stronger patients asking them to help the weaker patients of getting reinfected? Um, it turns out uh, that um, why they, they were still in the hospital because they were still infected. They still actively had virus in their blood, so no, they wouldn't get reinfected. Um, other very straightforward things: we just had to sit down and uh, and work out step by step what do we have to do every single step. Um, including labeling the bottles that were had the oral rehydration solution with with two lines um, as opposed to the bottles that had just water because patients would die if they didn't get enough of the oral rehydration solution water alone would would not help them to to live um, and we decided to um, devote all our time to the patients who were so sick that they were still in the tents not that those not to the people that were well enough to be outside the tent because they could usually help themselves or have other people help them um, we got everyone out of the tent so they didn't um, lose fluid and, and uh, potassium through their sweat as well as their vomit and diarrhea. Um, I mentioned stronger helping the weaker. Um, and again, uh, we just talk with the, the stronger patients without having to wear personal protective equipment um, through this, uh, over this protective fence because the virus is not spread through the air. So we kept a list every day or every time we had survivor, another survivor, 1, 3, 5, 10, 23, 36, 49. 57, 63, 70, and eventually there were 74 after I left, four that I knew that also survived. And uh, I blurred out the names so you can't see them, but this was the list. And this is another drawing that the librarian artist made. Um, idealized patients coming back into the community being embraced in their community. In reality, many were stigmatized and were not embraced back into the community. But we put up this list of survivors every time we had another survivor at eye level, at the entrance um, to the tent and the exit to the tent where the, where the nurses and and all of us work to remind us this is why we're here. This is what we're able to achieve together along with patients helping each other. So I'm just going to wrap up here, uh, show some pictures of really amazing stories. So this is really uh, um, what uh, uh, really gave us joy and the healthcare providers and made it possible for me personally to be able to keep going. Again, I want to emphasize Liberian healthcare workers, there's no option. They were there in the beginning of August and they were there until the end in March. Um, so someone had, at Doctors Without Borders, MSF, had a very good idea in early October to create what we call the survivor's wall. So patients could, if they wanted, put their hand into a color of paint that they wanted, uh, that they chose, and then put their handprint on the wall. So we start off with one panel, and then they could have their names if they wanted to. Most did, a few didn't. Um, and then it became two panels, uh, and there were lots of children uh, who survived. Uh, we tried to give them all uh, stuffed animals that MSF had in this big warehouse. It was lovely. And then we decided to put children together. You know, why not? Of course, children like to be with other children. They played together, they helped each other drink and eat and survive. Uh, and then some of the survivors 
um, before October, and there weren't many, but a few, they came back, they said, hey, we want our handprint on the survivor's wall. So pretty soon, there were more and more, three, then four panels, and then even more. And it was a very happy time uh, for the healthcare providers here, as well as for the patients. Uh, it was always hot. <laughs> this is not after we were in, uh, in the hot zone. This is just walking around. So you can see the, uh, you sweat all the time. So I drank lots of oral rehydration solution and water. I'd just take one bottle of each and just drink like this before I went in, in PPE, and when I came out in personal protective equipment uh, to try and be able to stay in longer. Um, uh, there are volunteers, as I said, from Liberia, from Europe, from Uganda, South Africa, Australia, USA, and, and elsewhere working together. Uh, the psychosocial and mental health team played an essential role in helping patients survive, and they organized the discharge planning for all of the patients, including the children who <coughs> became orphans. So one 10 year old uh, child uh, who survived, um, an Italian nurse, Alicia, who I worked with, uh, uh, gave him a uh, 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 drawing paper and colored pencils, and every day he'd make drawings. Um, and, you know, he was a remarkable uh, patient. Uh, we weren't sure if he was going to survive, but he did. But of course, everything that's in the hot zone has to be burned. So I took my uh, cell phone camera and enhanced it and just didn't reach over the orange barrier, but yeah, I didn't. It was safe. So I just zoomed in and uh, I took pictures of his drawings. So then when he left and all his drawings, originals were burned. Um, uh, uh, colleagues at MSF took, the, took, the, took my uh, cell phone camera pictures, enlarged them, laminated them, and then when he left, we gave him a going away present, or there they called it a leaving present, uh, of, of all his drawings. It's always a joyful day uh, when patients survive Ebola. Uh, children especially need even more help than adults, I would say, uh, especially if you don't have a, a biological relative who's got Ebola, who's surviving enough ahead of you to be strong enough to help you. Um, and that's where, again, we first had the idea to ask you know, pre-survivors, uh, adults who don't even know the child, to, to help the child. And then soon after, I don't know why it took me so long, it occurred to me, like, okay, why are we focusing only on the children? Okay, I understand children first. That's, okay, I understand that. But, and really, I'm just talking to myself here. I said, I said okay, what about the adults who are too weak? whether they're 18 years old or 28 or 58. Um, so that's when we said, okay, everyone has to help everybody else. The stronger have to help the weaker. And you know, just uh, honestly, I'm a human being like uh, you are, like everyone is, and, and it was wonderful to see the children and the adults survive. But it really gave resilience and strength to, to us, to healthcare workers, uh, Liberian and expat, to keep, to keep going. And again, for me, it was a short time, six weeks. For my colleagues in Liberia, it was many months. Uh, more than six months. So, um, and then some of the survivors came back to volunteer to help. And there was a potential risk of getting reinfected, although we think that they're immune. Nevertheless, they wore some protective equipment, uh, but it wasn't as heavy as what we wore, so they were able to work for longer periods of time. So one in particular I mentioned is Salome Kara, who had many, many, many uh, relatives who died of Ebola when she was in, um, um, in, this, in, in LWA 3, uh, but she survived. and. Uh, um, by September, and she came back in October, one of seven who started, seven survivors came back to the beginning of October um, to, to, to work, um, uh, mostly with the, the children. And this is uh, Salome Kara on the cover of Time Magazine, 26 years old. Uh, last year, I spent a little bit of time at the Ministry of Health uh, in Liberia, working with Dr. Moses Masakwe on protocols, lots of uh, NGOs and uh, Ministry of Health officials um, and Liberian colleagues, uh, some of whom ran another very big and very, very effective hospital called El Watu, um, particularly led by a surgeon named Dr. Jerry Brown, who's also on the cover of Time magazine. Um, and, uh, and then I went back, as was mentioned uh, by Dr. Tomogostin, in spring break. My students were on spring break and uh, just for a, a visit, if you will, to, to visit with my colleagues who I'd worked with in Liberia. And, um, and I hope to see some of the survivors. And it turned out that March 11th, when I was back on Minos to me, is a national holiday. It's called Decoration Day. It's uh, like in China, Tomb Sweeping Day. It's to honor the, the dead, the relatives, put flowers and wreaths on the grave. And so the MSF hospital, which now had zero Ebola patients, but had a clinic for um, survivors, because survivors have some problems uh, sometimes, uh, not always, but sometimes with their vision, with muscle pains and joint pains and depression. Um, um, so on this day, they, MSF really wonderfully, I think, had this uh, memorial service, um, and, 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 and hundreds of people came, all the healthcare workers, many survivors and relatives, 
Um, and then uh, whoever wanted to was, was allowed to pick up a single flower and to add it to, to, to the memorial. And you can see the orange tent and the, the orange fence in the background that I've mentioned before. So this is in loving memory of all those who died of Ebola. May their gentle souls rest in perfect peace. And they were singing poetry, recital, uh, plays, drama by uh, Liberian survivors and healthcare workers. An incredibly poignant, moving experience to be there. And these are some of the healthcare workers that I work with. Uh, one of the head nurses from our tents, uh, the head pharmacist, uh, Kennedy, the head administrative person who wrote a poem about survivors. Um, it was a wonderful time to be there. And then I worked with um, two other colleagues who are physician assistants, um, particularly Jackson Nima. We worked together for 42 days. Um, he also spoke at the UN Security Council for 11 minutes last September 18th about Ebola in Liberia. And now what he and his colleagues and the, some of the nurses uh, like uh, Sema and the pharmacist are doing is to try to help orphans and other children affected by Ebola to be able to get back into schools and to have enough food to eat to survive. So they took me to one of their schools. Um, um, and they started, uh, they started a, an NGO called Confidence Humanitarian Incorporated, or CHI. I'm going to finish up now. And some of the children who uh, are either orphans of, uh, because of uh, Ebola or impacted by, affected by um, Ebola uh, in terms of loss of uh, family members, uh, particularly, uh, particularly um, uh, parents. Um, um, so the children at the school that, uh, that uh, came and, and talked with uh, Jackson and his colleague Chris and myself uh, when we visited there on uh, March 12th. I came back March 24th, this is uh, headlines, the front page of the New Washington Post, after Ebola, new crisis for Liberians, survivors face a crippled economy and a lack of work. And also the children have even more, well, and partly as a result uh, of, of the crippled economy and the lack of work for adults. Today, the New York Times published this op-ed piece, um, I think it's page 823, by Dr. Bernice Don and colleagues. Dr. Don uh, is the Chief Medical Officer for the Liberian Minister of Health, and I was fortunate to be able to work with her. Uh, when I was there uh, at the end, uh, before I left uh, in the middle of November, um, someone I admire a lot, and I recommend this op-ed piece in today's New York Times to you uh, highly. Uh, so I'll finish here. So what's next? Next, well, again, I want to emphasize that what's next is Ebola. It's still here, and in my opinion, it's it's likely to become endemic in the human population in Guinea, uh, unlike any country ever before. It's endemic in the animal population. It comes from bats, from gorillas, chimps, small antelope. That's how people get infected, and then it spreads person to person. That's why there's been 24 outbreaks, but it's never been endemic in a human population, and I'm very afraid that's going to happen starting in Guinea, where the outbreak started 16 months ago. And now there's a lot of talk uh, here, uh, uh, understandably, about um, doing uh, after-action reports and lessons learned. After being involved with many outbreaks uh, over the years, some in this country like anthrax and many overseas, I've heard this term so many times, lessons learned, that for me, I would say that there are no lessons learned without proof by actions accomplished. And I'd like to stop there with the poem by Kennedy about survivors. So I welcome any questions or secondary comments that you might have. And thank you again very much for coming this, this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, sir, first question. Helping each other out thing was very important. Was this evenly followed throughout all the countries that were here with Ebola, or did you have good places in West Point? Uh, so the question, uh, as I understood it, is uh, the, uh, the concept of asking the stronger patients to help the weaker patients, is this something that was followed uh, uh, throughout uh, the entire country, uh, Liberia and other countries uh, uh, you know, affected by the epi uh, epidemic of Ebola? Um, I can't speak for other, uh, any place else except for Elwa 3, um, and, I, I, and I would say that it was followed um, uh, there. Um, you, know, you know, I talked with the, the, the South African doctor, the German doctor, there's a Swedish doctor later, um, there's another American doctor, and really it's all straightforward, but it helps perhaps to put it onto a single piece of paper or a poster. There's a poster over there that has the four steps to help our patients survive Ebola. But it was, you know, people were doing it before me, people were doing it after me, and I'm sure people were doing it in other, other well, I'm relatively sure that in some other places it was occurring. Um, but, uh, 
uh, I often, over the years of teaching and going to places where the outbreaks, just try to condense as much as I can into one page or one poster, add some color or some drawings. And uh, so for me, it was just, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking what other people had already thought of and just putting it together and then in one page and then trying to make it a, uh, a policy. But it, it quickly um, was adopted because it worked. And really, you know, partly why I went to Minister Health is just, I, I literally wasn't needed anymore. I really wasn't needed anymore, and I was so happy because of that. Yes, sir, question? Can you talk a little bit about that same idea, I guess, what the period of the stronger could help? You know, was this three days, five days? Mm -hmm. And in regards to research on a vaccine or anything, is there any direction in regards to uh, controlled uh, implementation and if people give it in Ebola so that they can have a minimal uh, protection against it and help people? Okay, uh, there are two questions, I believe. The first was how long uh, would the um, stronger patients, what I call pre-survivors, um, uh, still be in the hot zone in the hospital uh, and therefore able, if they chose to, if they agreed to, to help the weaker patients. And the second question, if I understood it correctly, was um, could you um, give a vaccine against Ebola that then would induce protective immunity so that such people then could work without fear of getting infected and could work for longer periods of time? So actually give them Ebola, the virus, did you? Something that puts them in that same scenario where they're the stronger, the stronger patient. Yep. Kind of okay. Um, uh, so the second question is more specifically about uh, trying to induce immunity by perhaps giving a very low dose of the virus itself, uh, causing a very mild infection. So the first question I would answer by saying that um, in a sense it was good news, uh, in a sense it wasn't, uh, that uh, often patients uh, would be uh, still in the um, pre-survivor stage, uh, the stronger stage for seven days, eight days, nine days, ten days. Sometimes it took a long time for the virus to go down to zero in the blood. So that was not good for them because you know they would like to leave. On the other hand, it was good for the weaker patients because they were there longer and they were strong enough to be able to help other patients. An amazing thing happened where increasingly the patients who were stronger, even after they would help weaker patients, even after the virus was gone from their blood, they chose to stay until whoever they were helping lived or died and almost always lived. It is incredibly moving. And often is not, more often than not, it was weaker patients were people they didn't even know. Uh, the second question, no, honestly, there's no safe amount of Ebola virus. We wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. I like to do, I mean, I, I always want to get a small dose of these new infections so that I become immune, so I don't have to worry about them anymore, because especially when there's no treatment or vaccine. But Ebola, you know, I used to talk about that with SARS and MERS and Ebola, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, no, 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 no. Especially if you're over 45, your risk of death is uh, over 90%, at least in those countries. And I'm definitely over 45. There's a question here and then here. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, you mentioned that there was sort of a number of needs in terms of PPE or more doctors. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, the international community trying to help. What, what did you think were the best channels to ask for help from the international community? Was it through Doctors Without Borders, the WHO, through the government of Liberia, Sierra Leone? What were the best ways to get the help you needed at the hospital? Uh, <laughs> So the question was, uh, what was the best way to get the help that we needed in terms of personal protective equipment, PPE, or, or other resources, um, national or international uh, ways, uh, organizations? And I would say anyone who wants to help. So MSF, they've been doing uh, responses to Ebola, pretty much every Ebola outbreak for 19 or 20 years. So really, it was wonderful to work for them. They had the equipment. They had the people that Help, uh, helped you put it on safely that most importantly told you how to take it off safely because you're so dehydrated you're walking in your own sweat and boots like you're walking on I won't say you're walking on water you're walking in mush and, but it's your sweat and you're very 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 um, hot uh, uh, temperature wise hot and, and, and you just want to um, get out of the equipment but you also want to stay longer because you know if you can just spend a few more minutes with a few more patients you can increase their chances substantially of surviving so MSF pretty much had uh, what, what, what we needed um, but otherwise, I'd say whatever uh, national or international um, uh, source of help that could help, ask them. But it's important that everything come through the country themselves, whether it's Sierra Leone, Guinea, or, or Liberia. 
and, and as colleagues. And that's what today's op-ed really emphasizes by Dr. Bernice Don from the Liberian Ministry of Health. Ma'am? So is it possible to genetically engineer the Ebola-Lars so they're safer use for vaccine like this? Uh, so the question is, is it possible to genetically engineer the Ebola virus so that it could be mm, mm, safely used um, for a vaccine? Um, I would say a qualified yes. Uh, in other words, what's been done for the vaccines that are being tested now in, in, in West Africa are to take just a part through, in a sense, through genetic engineering, to take just the surface glycoprotein or some of the part of the virus, but not the whole virus. So you, can't, so you have zero risk of causing Ebola um, and, and using that as the vaccine, with the idea being that the part of the uh, virus that you use, like a surface glycoprotein, we think is the part of the virus um, that stimulates the protective immune response. So zero chance of getting Ebola infection, but hopefully, and time will tell very soon, uh, a good chance of getting a protective immune response against the wild type virus itself. Uh, one more question, yes sir? Considering all the other infectious diseases in the area, what, where should Ebola be in the priority of treatment and prevention? So this is an important question that uh, um, it's coming up more and more now that uh, the number of uh, patients with Ebola, uh, sorry, it's an important question, let me repeat it uh, for everyone uh, um, who may not have heard it. Um, the question is, uh, given the many other uh, diseases, I'd say both infectious and non-infectious, I'm sure you meant the, uh, 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 in, in these three countries and neighboring parts of West Africa, uh, where should Ebola virus disease, which is what it's called now by World Health Organization, Ebola virus disease, not hemorrhagic disease, where should it be in terms of priorities, um, in terms of prevention and treatment? Uh, so for me, I'd say it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's necessary to prioritize, uh, but uh, there's no dichotomy. It's not an either-or situation. I think your question highlights that importantly. A lot of focus has been on Ebola. Um, uh, but I, I think it is important uh, to um, keep a focus, not the entire focus, but a focus on Ebola until as has been said so often recently, there are no more human cases, and then it stays that way for at least 42 days uh, before the outbreak can be declared over. It'll still come back because it's in the animals. We need to do more research and funding and on where it hides in the animals and then eventually figure out a way to stop it in the animals, whether it's through a Ebola vaccine for animals, for chimps or bats, I, I, I don't know, but someone needs to, uh, you know, to, 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 to do research on that and we need to figure that out. But the thing is that, as I showed in the hospital in Sierra Leone, that was true in Liberia, two hospitals just closed, one patient with Ebola. You could say, it's, oh, it's, you know, the, the fear is just too much. Well, you know what, I understand the fear and I hope from the very first slide that I showed, you know, dedicating the talk to, to one of the 860 plus health coworkers in West Africa have been infected and 500 dead. Unless we control Ebola, we're not going to be able to stop the epidemic of non-Ebola diseases during the time of Ebola. Uh, Dr. Tomokastin. Um, IV, you couldn't do the IV, which is just simply a supply issue. Mm. So thank you for asking me the question about uh, why, why was it intravenous or IV uh, treatment with fluids and, and potassium, other uh, sugar and other, other essential um, uh, elements to help people survive. Why wasn't it possible? Uh, it, 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 it was, it was a, a thought to be, and I understand this, uh, that there were too many patients that we couldn't safely give intravenous uh, fluids because you can't just mm, put in the IV and then have it on a, on a, like we do in the States. You can't do that. You have to have someone stand there and squeeze the IV bag and the fluid goes in. Um, and we had wonderful Liberian team who drew blood every morning uh, when we needed to draw blood for uh, just for testing for the virus. We couldn't test for anything else. We didn't have the ability to test for anything like potassium levels, which if too low or too high can kill the patient just in and of themselves, but are treatable. It's totally pre preventable and treatable, the, the, the life-threatening potassium levels. Um, eventually, though, as there got to be fewer and fewer patients in, after I left, um, I understand that sometime at, towards the end of November, then um, with many fewer patients. Um, there were 19 in total out of, uh, when I left, uh, as opposed to 136 when I arrived October 3rd. Um, so intravenous fluid was made available, and being able to measure potassium was made available. So I'd just like to say one last thing, because I know the hour's late, but thank you for bringing up that question, because in my view, 
It's my, my opinion. There's no proof because, to my knowledge, it hasn't been done. But as a physician, as a clinician, having worked with many, many different illnesses and many different patients and, and certainly with Ebola now, um, I would say it's straightforward that if it was up to me how best to offer treatment to patients with Ebola virus disease, it's straightforward. Every patient who comes in, you provide intravenous fluid, you give the vomiting, the, the medicines to stop the vomiting, anti-vomiting medicines and anti-diarrhea medicines, and you start, as soon as the vomiting is slowed down, or in between the vomiting, if you will, you start drinking the oral rehydration solution. And why do I say that? Because what I think is, in the beginning, it's a race against time. You're losing fluid. You have to replace it enough so the patient survives for seven or eight or 10 days, allowing their immune system to be strong enough to knock the virus down. It's not gone. They're pre-survivors then. But it's going down. And then your chance, and then you're strong enough to come out of the tent, to eat, drink, ask for new batteries for the radio, better food. You're going to live, most likely. So it's a race against time. So it's the first day, two, three days when they're still vomiting that you can't hold down enough fluid. Patients live or die over a couple of days when they come in. So if you can see, see them through the first three, four, five, six days, and it's really a matter of just giving enough fluid and, and, and potassium and, and sugar. So you give it intravenously and orally, and then pretty soon it might only be two days later, maybe three. You wouldn't need the intravenous fluid anymore because now the vomiting is under control and you can drink enough of the oral rehydration with help from stronger patients as well as to, to the extent possible given the, the personal protective equipment uh, limitations of, of time, um, uh, help from healthcare workers, but mostly it's going to come from other patients, the life-saving help. So again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to answer questions and talk with you today. Thank you so much. Really. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.